Hey you guys, this is Jessica and Noam here for another episode of What's That Sound? Today we are looking at the drum sound of Sunday Bloody Sunday by U2. Larry Mullen Jr. is the drummer, uh, the producer with Steve Lillywhite. It's a super roomy, distinct drum sound and it's really simple, but it's really specific. We're gonna figure it out. For our drums on this track, we used the Ludwig Vista Light -like kick drum, and we had the Yamaha Jimmy Chamberlain snare. And for our hi-hats, we used the Zildjian K-Suite 14-inch hats and an 18-inch K-Suite Zildjian Crash. For our drumming on this one, we're just playing a tight 16th note pattern, so you just want to be able to keep that four on the floor going, and you kind of have a marching-esque feel to the snare and hi-hat pattern. So just playing tight and being able to move between the hi-hat and snare will get you where you want to be on this one. So Sunday Bloody Sunday, it's a super unique drum sound, right? It's, it's one of these drum sounds where to fully understand it, you got you got to understand the context of culturally of like what drums were starting to sound like at the time, and that having these like really natural roomy drum sounds was not exactly what what most people were going for. Um, you also have to respect that like they made really really strong choices in this song, right? They knew that this this drum sound was going to be like a focal point. It was going to be a hook in this song. So they were not just deciding to record drums. They were they were deciding these drums are going to be specific to this record and every time these drums sound, you're going to know what record you're listening to. In order to decipher how they recorded this, um, the biggest clue for us was the, the width of things. When you record a snare drum, you're generally recording it with one mic if you're putting it close up. Uh, if you are recording a kick drum, same thing. Now for both, if you listen to this recording, you hear all this width that's going on. You don't hear a ton of snare drum that's coming from the center. You hear a lot of snare drum that's coming from the sides. Now, usually what that tells me is how much of the room mics are they using. Room mics have so much width in them because the left side of a room sounds very, very different from the right side of the room. It's, it's true that they also could be using stereo overheads, but the indicator here is how close does it feel. If they're getting their width on that snare drum from the stereo overheads, uh, generally there's a ton of definition in the hi-hat. There's a ton of definition in all these things. That's not the case for this. Everything feels a little bit more diffused, feels a little bit more blurry. And because of that, we can tell that most of this drum sound is coming from two mics, from the room mics. So knowing that the room mics are going to be such a big part of it, I decided to start my sound check with those first. Generally, once I get a, a, my first mic up, everything else is starting to fill in around it. Your decision making is based on what it does to those first mics that you checked. And so checking the kick drum mic, knowing that I'm not going to use it that heavily, or checking the snare drum mic, knowing that it's not going to be a huge part of the sound, it doesn't make any sense, right? I start with the room mics on this, and then everything else was just in support of those room mics. So on the room mics, I used a pair of AKG 414s. I spread them really wide in the room, and I also measured the distance from the kick drum to each of these and made sure that they were exactly to the inch equidistant from the front of the kick drum. The reason that I do this is for phase coherency. Anything that has timing differences, meaning the kick drum hitting one microphone before it hits another microphone, it's going to have extra width. It's also going to have extra phase issues. I, I use the term issues kind of lightly because they're only issues if they're, if they're causing things that you don't like the way that they sound. Um, on a snare drum, I'm less concerned with that because I, I like that width on that snare drum. On the kick drum, because you're getting down into ranges where things are going to start to go through subwoofers, 
which are single speakers. So all of a sudden your interactions uh, between two microphones, they're not happening in the room, they're happening electrically and then coming out of one speaker. I also am much more concerned with phase issues when I'm looking at the low end of anything. That's because when you're dealing with low end, all of the waveforms are much, much longer. They're all happening in slow motion, you can think of them. So any interaction that's gonna happen, if it's gonna be in the high end, it's gonna happen in an instant and you're not even gonna notice. If it's in the low end, if it's in 50 hertz and 60 hertz where you're getting these weird phase interactions, it's gonna happen in slow motion and so you're gonna feel, oh, that kick, this one kick drum uh, doesn't quite have the low end that this other one has or this has, has too much low end for a second or all these weird little interactions that it's much more important to be phase coherent in the low end than it is in the high end. Oftentimes when people record room mics and they're just meant to be supportive to the main drum sound, they'll smash them up with a compressor, right? This is meant to bring out all of the length of the rooms. This is meant to, to bring out all these excitement uh, pieces of, of the room. For this, because the room mics were gonna be most of the sound, compression on the room mics were not for excitement. They were not to hype things up. They were not to make things feel extra bombastic. What they were was to control the transients. The transients of a room mic, usually they're getting covered up by all the direct signals, right? The reason they're getting covered up is because the direct ones hit first. So you get the sound of all of your direct mics and then milliseconds later, you get the sound of your room mics and the attack of them get covered up. For this instance, that attack was gonna be really, really front and center. And so by putting a 1176 compressor on these rooms, we were able to super duper control the width of that attack, how much it punched out at you, how much it then get clamped down and controlled, all of these aspects of how the, the actual impact of those drums sounded, we were able to control with a compressor. For the overheads, we used Mic Shop C12s. These are beautiful high-end tube microphones. They have a really full sound, really natural high-end. We're not using them that much in this recording, but them in, in themselves, they're a really good drum sound. They're just here to give a little bit of extra definition to the cymbals. For kick drum, we used an AKG D12. Uh, this is a classic vintage kick drum sound. It's not too high endy, it's not too low endy, it's just really well balanced, especially for, for the time. And again, we're not using it too heavily, so it's not holding that much weight. It's just meant to give a little bit of focus to that kick drum sound that's coming from the rooms. On snare drum, we're using a Biodynamic 201. This is similar to a SM57. It, it has a little bit more extended of a, of a high end and a low end, so it tends to be just a little bit more balanced, like needs a little less EQ. 
It also is hypercardioid, meaning that it's a little easier to cut out the hi-hat from it if you position it correctly, where the rejection is going in the direction of the hi-hat. We're using it kind of minimally. It's just there to, to add a little bit of focus and a little bit of support to the snare drum sound that, that is coming from the rooms, but it's not holding too much weight. That was Sunday Bloody Sunday by U2. Thank you for watching, and as always, please let us know in the comments what other drum sounds you'd like to hear us break down. We will see you next time. Oh, we didn't do any fun, silly see you next well, time I at the end like of the other video either. I feel either. like we've kind of matured <laughs> since last time a bit. I disagree. I don't think we're more mature at all. <laughs>